We have reached the appointed hour. I, we, we got a, have we have a quorum here? We do not have a quorum yet. We'll start our meeting uh, in spite of not having a quorum. It is the appointed hour. When a quorum arrives, we will officially call the meeting to order. Uh, thank you all for coming. Those of you that came on time, thank you for being here on time. I appreciate it. Uh, today we're going to do an overview of the Department of Natural Resources Asset Preservation and Flood Mitigation uh, work program, whatever you want to call it. And we have Kent Lakishmo here uh, to be with us. Uh, if you'd like to come forward and introduce yourself for the record, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm uh, Kent Lakishmo, Director of Capital Investment for DNR. Thank you, uh, Director. Please uh, go ahead with your uh, uh, members of the committee. If you have questions, please uh, get our attention. Uh, Kent has agreed to interrupt his presentation if we have questions for him during his presentation. Uh, please, Director, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And what I'm going to do today is give a quick overview of the department's uh, request uh, from 2014, so it probably puts it in a little bit of context. Yep. And then. Uh, uh, focus on uh, asset preservation needs and following that I've got a uh, PowerPoint that shows the uh, flood hazard mitigation needs. So uh, DNR's mission as you know is to uh, have conservation that works and we try to balance the, uh, the, three, uh, the three circles here, outdoor recreation, economic development and natural resource protection. In our capital budget request for uh, 2014, we were looking at implementing the governor's goals for better government, addressing the, our priorities of maintaining a strong conservation infrastructure, and that gets to uh, uh, dealing with uh, asset preservation, and then also just powering the state's natural resources economic engine. And we have significant unmet uh, capital investment needs that I'll get into more detail on, and uh, also point out that uh, we put money to work quickly and we spread it uh, across the state. We have facilities in uh, all counties. Our uh, capital asset portfolio for DNR is worth over $2 billion, so it does take uh, uh, a fair amount to take care of that. Um, taking care of all of our state assets will help improve the delivery of public services, ensure the health and safety of uh, Minnesotans, reduce operating costs, and increase uh, efficiencies. The, uh, uh, the types of things that we asked for uh, in the 2014 uh, capital budget request were, and these were in the priority order that we asked for. And I guess I should point out that uh, Commissioner Landwehr has made it a, a top priority to deal with, uh, with asset preservation and dealing with the facilities that we have. And uh, that is the, uh, is the first, uh, uh, the first uh, request, buildings and facilities development was a second. The flood hazard mitigation, we'll get into that in uh, more detail. Uh, dam repair, reconstruction, removal, fish hatchery improvements, uh, groundwater monitoring. You'll notice an asterisk uh, by that. Those are the ones that uh, we had requested uh, dollars for but did not receive funding in, in uh, 2014. Uh, and this picture on this one is a uh, forest road in uh, Bedora State Forest. So you see the uh, top part of this is the rather uh, shaky bridge that uh, you might not want to try to drive across and replaced with a, uh, with a culvert. This was a $70,000 project uh, that was done by a local contractor. Uh, Director, I'm going to interrupt you for just a moment. Uh, we now have a quorum uh, attending, so I'll officially call the meeting to order. Uh, Representative McGinney, would you like to move approval of the minutes? Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, we can just move approval of the minutes of, uh, I had a date here, uh, February 5th. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. And opposed by the same sign. Thank you. Director, go ahead. Uh, and then moving on for the, uh, the state's uh, natural resources economic engine, just to, to point out briefly, the, the hunting, fishing, wildlife uh, watching activities contribute $4.3 in sales to the Minnesota economy. The state trail users generate 30,000 jobs in Minnesota and spend 2.4 billion on travel expenses. State park visitors are spending tourism dollars throughout the state. Forest industry is 60,000 plus jobs 
Then the healthy forests support uh, $16.2 billion of uh, economics. The continuing on our request within last year of state land reforestation stand improvements, Vermilion State Park, school trust acquisition, and the native seed processing complex, the last two did not receive funds. And then our unmet capital investment needs. There's, uh, we probably have uh, $25 million thereabouts to complete the remaining uh, community flood protection projects. And there are other activities beyond that for impoundments that help increase the uh, factor safety of flood protection works. Five million uh, annually to expand the groundwater monitoring network needed for water supply planning. Uh, and that's to finish the uh, uh, a statewide plan would be to have 7,000 wells spread throughout the state. And the uh, $5 million is a step in that direction. The total cost for that is, I believe, in the neighborhood of uh, $70 million. $5.7 million annually to repair the state's 800 public dams. Uh, public dams are those owned by the state and by local units of government. For the state's uh, owned dams, we pay 100% of the cost for the other uh, publicly owned dams, the program is to spend uh, uh, on a one-to-one -one match to provide grants for the reconstruction of locally owned public dams. And then uh, $3 million annually for reforestation activities. And this just shows the uh, distribution of our work uh, sites across the state. We've got 225 uh, work sites and we have recreational facilities in every county in the state. We own and uh, maintain uh, over 2,700 buildings. The uh, capital investment, uh, budget investments that we make put people to work all across the state. And the estimates that we've seen for jobs is that for every $1 million spent for construction, that supports uh, 24 jobs. Uh, this slide uh, wasn't updated, so it only goes through 2013. But it just shows the uh, uh, the Brown color is the uh, authorized uh, uh, funds that are already obligated. The blue shown on these uh, uh, bar charts are the unobligated funds as of uh, like a year ago. And for the uh, cancellation report that I know you heard a few uh, uh, meetings ago, uh, for 2009-2010, uh, I think our cancellation number was a little under $2,000. So we've been able to utilize the money and and uh, spend it where it uh, was intended to be spent. Excuse me, Director. I believe Representative Runbeck has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> and I'm sorry, your name again was? Kent Lockesmo. Right. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, you. Back to the slide on um, the public dams. So the $5.7 million you're requesting, roughly how many dams are you proposing? And do you know which dams those are at this point? Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative. I, well, it, it varies considerably. The cost for the repair of the dams uh, would range <coughs> from uh, Bronson Dam, which we don't have on the list yet because it's still in design, Terrible. is likely to be a $9 million project. It's in Bronson State Park. It's state owned. We would pay 100% of that cost. There's other dams within that list that the fix is only $200,000 to uh, 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 rehabilitate the dam. So we do prepare a dam safety priority list that's required by statute to be done by June 30th of the odd numbered years. So that uh, has been completed and actually it was just recently updated in, uh, in January to reflect the results of some recent inspections. So we do have a list that uh, um, basically you need the 5.7 million or thereabouts every year for the next 20 years to, to keep up with this aging infrastructure. Okay. Thank follow you, up, Chair. Representative. No, I'm fine. Thank you. Uh, Representative Swazinski has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Director Lacasmo. Uh, just looking at uh, your slide, um, looking at your buildings, and you've got just kind of listed 2,761 different buildings. Do you have a rough guesstimate on square footage um, that we're looking at? I mean, obviously, that's something you can get back to us on, but um, just you know, from a square footage standpoint, what your um, Director Lockesmo. And uh, Mr. Chairman, Representative, and I can get back specifically on it. I think it's a little over $2 million. Okay. But uh, I'll have to verify that. Thank you, Director. Uh, Representative Albright has a question. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Director Lacasmo, if you could just back up one slide. Thank you. Um, it, it's, it's curious to me that despite the fact that the authorized amount is lower, uh, starting in a, a 12 and 13, that the amount of unobligated is substantially larger as a percent of the overall uh, bonding expenditure by year. I'm just wondering if you could speak to why that is occurring and if that's a trend line that we are starting to observe and if, if that's problematic to the way that we go about uh, looking at projects and, and whether or not they're, uh, they have merit for moving forward from a year to year basis. Uh, Director Lux. Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative, I probably misspoke as I explained what this chart represents. The total bar is, shows all of the authorized dollars and the brown is the authorized and already obligated or encumbered. So the blue is the only amount that's unencumbered out of what was authorized. Uh, Representative Albright, a follow-up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, to my point then, if they're unobligated but that they were first requested, what is that money going to be used for? Director Locke. Mr. Locke. Chairman, uh, Representative. Um, the design for the project probably hasn't been completed yet, so we haven't put it out for bid, so it's not uh, encumbered for a specific project yet. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Oakland has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Director Lockesmo, nice to see you again. Um, yes, I guess I would be remiss to not ask about the school trust land, um, uh, land acquisition monies and things. Uh, uh, there was on page two in the slide. Could you kind of update me and give me some of the details on that? Director Locke, as well. Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Ogham, the, uh, the, re the department made a request to acquire some of the interest in the school trust lands. We've got, uh, for example, public access, uh, public accesses that have been built on school trust lands. Mm -hmm. So those are lands that are not generating any money for the trust. And so to make the trust whole, we would acquire those lands and uh, continue their use for the public recreation purposes that they have. And then that money would uh, be available within the school trust for those purposes. Thank you. Uh, Representative O'Driscoll has a question. <coughs> well, thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Director. I'm going to follow up on Representative Uglum's um, inquiry regarding school trust lands. Um, that's becoming a very popular item around the legislature to um, fulfill the fiduciary obligations that we're charged with by the Constitution and on our trust duties. And I know that the DNR was charged with uh, prioritizing lands as to how they were going to be using those and other assets that um, are owned by the trust. In your plan and proposal for 2015 that we're looking at today, does it include any monies that the DNR is looking for to reunite fees on properties where there may be school trust lands that are orphaned in the middle of um, other properties or other projects that the DNR has to put those under state of Minnesota ownership along with the other properties that it surrounds and or buying those properties out and um, putting forth that, that prioritization list that the legislature asked the uh, department to, to put together. Director Lockes, Mom. Um, Mr. Chairman and Representative, I'm, uh, uh, I may have to phone a friend on that one. Um, the, um, and I think we'll have, to, because we do have, uh, uh, there have been discussions about how to deal with the trust lands, and I haven't been engaged in all of those, so I think we'll have to get back to the committee on that. Question. Do you have any friends here today? Uh, Dr. <laughs> I do have friends here, but. Director? Uh, oh. I see one coming. Oh. Uh, please introduce yourself for the record. Mr. Chairman, members for the record, Bob Meyer, Assistant Commissioner with the Department of Natural Resources. I believe Representative Driscoll was asking about the, the current governor's budget rec bonding recommendations. Representative Driscoll. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Meyer, welcome, and it's good to see you. Uh, here is, uh, again, what I was looking at is the DNR was charged with putting together a prioritization list of acquiring properties from the trust. And some of those might have been reuniting properties that the state of Minnesota may own around or that might otherwise um, be uh, 
creating some, some management related issues because we have two separate owners, one by the trust and, and the other. My question is pretty straightforward. Is there money in this proposal today to implement that plan that the legislature charged the DNR with and helping to acquire? Uh, I realize that there's DNR monies for DNR properties, but some of those properties may need to be purchased from the trust or, or the like that the bonding monies may be able to be used for. So I'm just looking for an update on that, if your proposal includes any of that or, or where we might be at. Director Meyer. Mr. Chairman, Representative Driscoll, we're presenting a history of our bonding proposals, not a governor's bonding request here today. So we have submitted requests for bonding funds to, to buy out those lands in the past. They have not made it through the process. We also are, are waiting to, for final comments from the Department of Education for the report on the million dollars that were appropriated last year within the supplemental budget to expedite some of our school trust fund activities. I believe some of those dollars are going to be recommended to work on the BWCA exchange, which is moving forward faster than we thought right now. So that will expedite and change some of that land management ownership. But right now I cannot speak for the governor's 2015 capital bonding request as that's not been finalized yet. Representative O'Driscoll. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Mr. Meyer, um, it's good to hear that there is going to be some conversation on that because um, as Representative Uglum started with a conversation today, this is a very important item to the legislature. And it seems like every year it gets a little bit more traction of watching out for the kids and their interests on these properties. So I, I for one, know I'll be looking forward to seeing and, and discussing that proposal. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, just a little bit on that background. We have done the, the research and the report, I believe it's presented to the Permanent School Trust Fund Committee. It's estimated to be about 53 to $80 million needed to buy out those trust lands that do have um, environmentally, that are environmentally sensitive to the trust. So that, I mean, that's kind of the package you're looking for, 50 to $80 million and how that's done. It'll be uh, the Permanent School Trust Fund and the legislature and, and the, the soon to be hired trust lands director of the Department of Administration who will be working on those issues. So. Do you have a date? <laughs> a hiring date? Mr. Chairman, Representative O'Driscoll, um, committee members, we're finalizing the PD. It's one of the things we hope to be discussing at Monday's meeting um, at the Permanent School Trust Fund Commission. So. Very good. Chair. Thank you. Uh, Representative O'Driscoll. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Meyer, you had indicated that there's between 55 and maybe $80 million needed to do that. Um, if I'm not mistaken, the legislation also asked for a plan to be able to have that done in five years. We might be three years left in that five-year plan. So again, I want to underscore the importance of that to myself and to apparently a lot of other legislators who are sitting on this commission as well today. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Director. Uh, Director Lockesmo, go ahead. Uh, thank you. The, uh, for, as part of our capital budget request, like I said, was asset preservation. And uh, the department's definition for asset preservation is uh, specifically to natural resources. And uh, this is something that I believe uh, Representative Hansen uh, authored uh, several years ago. The, uh, and it's much broader, so it's not just buildings. It's for all of the DNR's assets. So it, it would include trails, water control structures, roads, bridges, all types of uh, assets. And um, uh, this uh, slide just shows the uh, statutory definition. And uh, it includes things like code compliance uh, to uh, meet the uh, accessibility ADA requirements, uh, do hazardous material abatement, air quality improvements, energy efficiency, the building infrastructure repairs, but then also repairs to trails and bridges and other improvements uh, to land. We, uh, we have estimated that our natural resource asset preservation needs exceed $500 million a year or, uh, over at least the next uh, 10 years. We've got the 2,700 uh, plus buildings. That's uh, uh, $13.7 million annually for rehabilitation could be spent. We have 3,000 miles of roads, 100 plus road bridges, $2.5 million a year. There's 590 miles of paved trails and there's 100 miles that are in very uh, poor condition. Uh, there's one section on the uh, Cicada Trail down by Waterville that uh, is in such uh, poor condition that people are riding on the highway instead of the trail. So it's, uh, there are those types of examples across the state system that we uh, need to address. Director, I have a question for you from Representative Runbeck. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And to your point about the paved trails, um, what, what seems to be the 
the life cycle of a, of a typical paved trail? How often are we requiring now to, to sur resurface that? Director Lockes, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Runbeck, um, 20 years for resurfacing the Waterville uh, Trail, for example, I and mean, one of the things that happened there is it was an old railroad grade and they didn't uh, scarify the bed uh, as they constructed it, so it's, uh, uh, it's very, very uneven compared to uh, what we'd, how you would construct it today. But uh, 20 years is probably a reasonable life. You may have to do a little bit of resurfacing and repair in between that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, we have a question from Representative Oglum. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Director, um, w with regard to the trails, uh, I'm a big snowmobiler and uh, four-wheeler guy, um, and you do receive some revenues uh, from those particular groups. Do you receive any other revenues that can go into uh, maintaining, maintaining these trails? Director Locke, uh, Mr. Chairman, Representative, there are, well, certainly, I mean, there are legacy funds. There are uh, there are water recreation funds that go into those types of facilities. So there are other other sources of funds, and I um, I'd have to provide uh, some right. better detail on on that if I could. Representative Ogle. Just to follow up, Mr. Chair, um, Director Lacasmo, um, I was really kind of speaking of user groups in terms of uh, people that use the trails, uh, other users, do you get any revenue from, from them? Director Lockesmo. Um Mr. Chairman, Representative Uglum, I, I, you know, there's some revenue that comes in. If, how much of that and, and what it's available for, I would have to verify and get back to the committee. Okay. Or, I, uh, a follow-up, Representative? Um, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Well. Um, for instance, uh, bicyclists and and uh, and other people like that, uh, <clears throat> do they get a sticker or pay anything or anything like uh, that? Mr. Chair, Director Lockesmo, Representative Oglum, um, there are no uh, uh, fees for bicyclists or rollerbladers or whatever to utilize state trails. Uh, Representative Volk. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Mr. Director. Curious when you put together an acquisition plan for properties, is there an operational plan put together at the same time so that it looks at the ongoing expense of projects? Director Lockes, Um Mr. Chairman, Representative, um, well, for, I guess it, it may depend on which, on what type of properties. I mean, certainly, I mean, we buy property for a uh, myriad of uh, activities, whether it's a wildlife management area or a trail or uh, uh, park expansion. Um, and certainly, I mean, some of those have plans to how to utilize all of the property. Uh, we buy, for a wildlife management area, for example, if there's buildings uh, on that uh, property, uh, we have a plan on how to address those buildings or wells or septic systems that are on the property as we acquire it. Chair, Mr. Mr. Director, I, I guess what I'm, I'm looking at here is if a lot of these things seem to be accumulating from year to year and there's only so many dollars to go around and if we're going to acquire property, then wouldn't it be prudent to have a long-term plan on how we're going to maintain it because infrastructure always causes overhead and if we don't take both of those things into account, we end up with these large bills that are hard to pay. Is there anything being done or thought to be done as far as matching before an acquisition is done a long-term operating plan to know where the funding is coming from? Director Locke, uh, Mr. Chairman, Representative, we are in the process of developing a plan to address uh, the asset preservation needs going forward for all of uh, state facilities so that uh, and that's looking at, uh, you know, the trails that are in dire circumstances in need of replacement now, but next year there'll be some more that get added onto that list. So we're, we're in the process of developing a 10-year plan for all of our facilities. And part of what uh, has been done, I think I'll get to it in a couple more slides, is that the Department of Administration has a process that all of the buildings in the state have been assessed on a uniform basis so there's a, a way to compare the relative condition 
uh, across the state system. So we have that information that's just recently become available. We're currently doing the analysis, but it rates buildings on a scale of uh, one to five, one being very poor and five being excellent. And we've got so many in each category. So that process is, uh, is proceeding. Mr. Chair, just one more follow-up. Thank you. Mr. Director, so what I'm wondering though is going forward, if we're going to make an acquisition and we don't have a plan for the ongoing operating cost, is there something in the works now that when we, before we make the acquisition, that we actually have an approved plan go with the acquisition so that we know if we're spending a million dollars for something that we're going to have to expend another million dollars over the next so many years and where it's going to come from? Director uh, Lockes. Mr. Oh. Chairman, uh, Representative, as part of our strategic land asset management system, we are taking a more comprehensive look at, uh, at acquisitions, so we look at the total picture. Yes. Uh, Director, specifically to the legacy funds for trails and the maintenance of those trails that are acquired by the legacy fund, is, is there any opportunity to use legacy funds to maintain the trails that the funds uh, acquire? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, yes. Good. Um, continuing on, the uh, annual uh, asset preservation needs. You know, we've got nearly uh, 5,000 campsites and 87 camp campgrounds uh, within our uh, 66 state parks. That would uh, represent an annual need of five and a half million. There's 188 uh, sanitation shower buildings for an annual cost of four million. Uh, 725 vault toilets, $870,000. There's 505 paved water access sites. The rehabilitation of those could be uh, four million a year. And uh, for state trails, I think I've already mentioned, it's about $200,000 a mile to do the rehabilitation. And that's without looking at bridges. And uh, bridges are the expensive parts of those. And uh, that could be a $3 million a year. Director, uh, Representative Hansen has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Director Lacosmo. On the asset preservation, um, if we appropriated uh, money there. How fast could you move? I'm assuming fixing roofs and uh, uh, rehabilitating the, the toilets and those type of things. You're hiring local contractors. If we appropriated money this year, how quickly would there be uh, people out there working making those fixes? Director Lacus. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Representative Hansen, the uh, much of those dollars could be put to work pretty quickly. There still is design that needs to go into even uh, a roof. And so there are some, but some of those are relatively easy designs that could be done quickly. Uh, resurfacing a trail uh, uh, is a relatively easy design. So much of, much of it could be uh, put to work very, very quickly. Uh, some this fall, the majority in 2016. Representative Wigginius has a question. Mr. Chair, I'm looking at the 505 paved public water access sites. Um, in the past, when DNR constructed many of these uh, access sites, they turned out to be great gatherers of water and drained them right into the lake. Uh, so you were uh, contaminating the lake. So there, we gave DNR money to figure out redesigns so that that would not happen. So when you're using asset preservation money, will you be using the old, just a repaving an old conduit to the lake, or will you be redoing it so you're not putting uh, water into the lake, just gathering water up and putting it into the lake? Director uh, Lockus, Mr. Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Wiggins, we would be uh, uh, meeting the current design parameters. So we would be dealing with stormwater on the site. Ultimately, the water is going to go in the lake, but we want to treat it first. Yeah. And we would also want to have sites uh, developed so you could treat for invasive species on uh, existing accesses if there's area available to do that. Thank you. Director, I have a question. I, it, it's kind of a sideline, but I understand that at some boat landings, there's a problem with erosion or the 
boats are gunning their engines to get up onto their trailers and that backwash is scouring out the bottom of the lake. Is there anything we can do to prevent that? Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, you know, certainly you could extend the uh, ramps out further uh, so then uh, the concrete wouldn't erode as the sand does when they do that. Uh, I mean, people are encouraged not to do the power loading of boats, but I don't think it's a practice that's going to stop. Um, so the uh, alternative would be to have more coarse material at the uh, end of the ramp, whether or not it's concrete or, or, uh, or you know, more coarse gravel so it doesn't get blown out by the, uh, by the prop wash. Thank you. Um, this is uh, just some examples of uh, old, uh, old buildings. Uh, this is the Glenwood office building. You can see it's not ADA accessible. It's uh, got poor heating, poor ventilation. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that's not uh, code compliant. It's not rodent proof. Uh, this is the uh, Ortonville uh, storage building. This uh, 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 was flooded and following the floods you have, uh, you have mold, you have other problems. The, uh, this is just a typical uh, road washout. This is a forestry uh, uh, road that uh, high flows uh, end up taking away some of the uh, pavement. Uh, this is a uh, Heartland uh, State Trail bridge, the Steamboat River Bridge. You can see the uh, red, uh, the end of the red rod that's sticking in is uh, probably a five foot uh, long rod, so that uh, rotted uh, piece is uh, not in uh, very good shape. And, and uh, when we find these, uh, we often have to put uh, load restrictions on these bridges in, uh, until they can be replaced. Uh, this is uh, just a one of the old uh, dams in the system. Uh, this ends up being a, uh, uh, the blowdown at, uh, at uh, St. Croix Park. And uh, what I'd like to go back to is uh, on the uh, uh, facility condition assessments that we've done across the state, we ended up, uh, they, as I said, they rate those in uh, five categories with the uh, number one being the worst case, the crisis condition. We have 215 buildings that are in that, uh, in the worst uh, condition. And the deferred maintenance value on that, according to this process uh, set up by Department of Administration, is $17.7 .7 million to address those uh, uh, 215 buildings. And in the poor category of buildings, we have another 540 buildings and that would have a cost of uh, 37.2 million to address those deficiencies. So in the worst two categories of buildings uh, statewide, we have uh, 54 million dollars plus of uh, needs in the uh, very poor and poor category of buildings. So out of our 2,700 buildings, we, when we, do, we have 942 that are in average condition, 729 that are in good condition, and 276 in excellent condition. And what the uh, whole process, they looked at all of the facets of a building, the roof, the uh, uh, treatment systems, the uh, heating, ventilation, and rated everything. And then a cumulative rating got to these uh, overall ratings for the buildings. But uh, as you can see, there's a significant uh, unmet need for, uh, for our asset preservation. Representative Runbeck has a question. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Director Lacasmo. So on that topic, going back to the Glencoe building, um, I mean, it appears to be one that's in poor condition. And I guess I'm wondering, uh, do you look where opportunities like this might be to abandon a building and then go to just leasing space in the, in the city somewhere? I'm certain there's office space available. Director Lacasmo. <laughs> And uh, Mr. Chairman, Representative, yes, we look at all options. Uh, this uh, building is on site of the uh, hatchery at uh, Glenwood. And uh, so there's a need for having uh, staff on site. So we are looking at uh, uh, rebuilding this uh, at this site. But on other places in the, hist in the uh, you know, last year's discussion, we looked at and we received some money for pre-design looking in Rochester. In, uh, in Bemidji and other places. In Rochester, there's 11 agencies all in leased facilities. So we're looking at options down there, whether or not it makes sense to build a buyer lease. So we evaluate all of those options and see what might be the most uh, effective for everyone. Mm -hmm. 
Mr. Chair, Representative Mr. Um Any idea, you probably do, of the, the ratio of leased facilities to owned? Director Lockes, mm. The, I would say generally uh, we're in owned uh, facilities, but uh, we can get back to the committee with some specifics on uh, leased versus uh, owned. That would be just fine. Yeah, that would be helpful. And um, I mean, it, it does seem as though if it's not specialized workspace, that um, leasing would make more sense to, to me anyway. Thank you, Representative. Thank you. Representative Uglum. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Director Locksmoa, when we're talking about buildings, um, uh, I'd like to uh, just ask you a couple questions about the um, building I drive by almost every weekend, the uh, Walker. Uh, the city of Walker, the uh, the new DNR building that's that's uh, that got done there this last year or two. Um, beautiful, beautiful building, but uh, in many cases I can see where you go through design and maybe you hire an architect or whatever. But in that particular case, a lot of big native trees, pines were cut down, and and uh, it's and uh, the whole planting structure was course native grasses and everything else it looks really nice however it's right on the edge of the city it just doesn't quite fit in um, it seemed to me that it's a wonderful beautiful big facility but it seems that in these tough times we probably spent uh, quite a deal quite a great deal of money on that that maybe we didn't have to do you guys put out for bid with the architectural firms or design firms do you do you put that out for bid and how do you evaluate the design and the cost benefit. Director Lock as well. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative, well, I, I believe the building you're referring to is a federal building in Walker and not a state building. Is it federal? I, 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 I thought that uh, we had DNR people in there too. Uh, there may be, you know, maybe we're leasing space uh, from the federal government, and we have done that in other occasions. I know we have some lease space from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife <laughs> Service in Detroit Lakes. But the building in Walker is a, is a federal building. But for our design, um, we do uh, uh, much of the design internally, but then we also have, uh, uh, have some projects that are bid out for uh, architectural services and specific design services for, for example, the mechanical systems in a, um, in a building would be something that's uh, contracted out. Okay. Representative Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, then, uh, then with my neighbors up at the lake, I can blame the feds for uh, that cost overrun. Thank you. <laughs> That'd be appreciated. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Director, I know that in many sites you've added uh, <coughs> solar power or wind power uh, as a power source. Uh, and approximately how many of those installations or what percentage of installations uh, do you utilize uh, that type of energy? Uh, Mr. Chairman, for wind, uh, we only have that uh, in the facility south of Marshall um, at the park. And uh, that uh, malfunction, I think that's being rebuilt right now. Uh, in solar, we have uh, about, uh, I guess I'd have to, uh, I mean, we did have made a, uh, a commitment to uh, uh, increase the amount of uh, solar energy. We have uh, uh, this uh, new Ulm office, for example, just put in a large array. Um, we have a, an array at Grand Rapids. Uh, we're doing some at Itasca. I can get back with a specific number of uh, megawatts, kilowatt hours that we have and number of sites. Thank you, Director. Uh, the other thing as far as buildings that I should mention, one of the things that we have is uh, a third of the buildings in state parks are on the National Register of Historic uh, uh, buildings, so they are more expensive to build than uh, or repair than uh, something without that designation. An issue. And we also uh, internally we do charge divisions based on the number of square feet that they occupy a maintenance charge. So we have about three and a half million dollars a year that the agency uses to do some of the emergency type work and the stuff that's not bondable. So there are things that we are funding uh, with our own funds that uh, and not using uh, bond dollars for. Thank you, Director. Uh, I believe you've finished your first half of the presentation. Are you ready to go on to yes. uh, the flood uh, mitigation? And, uh, 
members, you should have a second uh, packet of sheets with the uh, slides from his next presentation. All right. Get out of this one. Uh, Representative Hausman, <coughs> uh, while we have a little break here, you had brought some material to committee. Would you care to just review that with us? Yes. I, I, I always like to see history when we're talking about it. And so last year we asked, uh, and I think it was Mr. Lacasmo who put this together. I, it may have been him or staff, I'm not sure. Uh, and it just shows, one of them shows projects in the Red River Basin and it's local share, state share, federal. And then you see the totals and then the rest of the state, uh, just to give a sense of what we've accomplished so far. Just thought it might be interesting as background for. If so this is strictly uh, flood mitigation and strictly in the Red River Valley, is that no, correct? No, one is Red River, and then oh. uh, the first page is Red River, and I Mr. See. Chair, and the second is then projects yeah. outside the well, Red River there. Basin. I so see. to get the total, you'd have, have to add uh, the total on page one and no, total on page there. three. And this goes all the way back to 1997. Correct. Through 2014. It's kind of small print, Representative. Yes. Uh, <laughs> we're testing, we're testing your eyes. But uh, if I get my bifocal lined up, I can read it, so that's good. There, well, after that little commercial interlude, we now will continue with uh, Director Lacus Moe's presentation. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll give a quick overview on the, uh, the uh, flood hazard mitigation grant uh, program. In, uh, uh, Pat Lynch, who uh, administers this uh, program in DNR, is in the audience to uh, also answer questions if need be. The uh, flooding is a number one disaster, natural disaster in the United States. It's uh, $8 billion in damages uh, and uh, 89 flood fatalities per year in the United States. This picture is, is of the Red River of the North in uh, 1997, which we all remember as a very large event. One of the highest crests on record, however, incurred on the Red River near Moorhead was in 1897, 100 years prior to the 1997 flood. So between 1957 and 2014, there have been uh, 42 flood-related federal disaster declarations in, uh, in Minnesota. Uh, this picture is a picture of the city of Rushford in 2007. Uh, here, the city of Rushford had a Corps of Engineers designed levy. Uh, it was protected to the 100-year flood elevation, so many of the people behind this levy didn't carry flood insurance. That levy was overtopped by a larger flood, and, uh, and uh, you can see the result. There was uh, all, you know, the, entire whole, the entire city then was uh, flooded. And we've done some improvements uh, to their project, and it's about uh, uh, three and a half million dollars worth of additional work that has been done down there, and 2.7 million of that was through the uh, flood mitigation program. This uh, flood mitigation is cost effective. The FEMA uh, study shows that uh, every one dollar invested in mitigation is worth uh, four dollars in uh, savings. And uh, since 87, we've removed 3,400 structures from the floodplain. And that's, that's been our, uh, one of our highest priority items to do, is to uh, uh, move them out of harm's way instead of trying to control the flood. And uh, there's thousands more that have been protected by, by various other structural means, levees, diversions, flood walls. The, uh, the examples include the, uh, uh, in the city of Austin, we've paid, uh, uh, $13 million of total cost, $6.5 million of local funds, and, and $6.5 from the state. 
to remove homes from the floodplain. And uh, those uh, efforts avoided $7.3 million in damages in 2010. The uh, city of Oslo along the Red River of the North has uh, their project was built uh, for three million dollars in the mid uh, 70s, I believe it was, and uh, the core has say, has stated that they've avoided 78 million dollars in damages since then. We're in the process of reconstructing those uh, uh, those levees to move them away from the riverbank to make the uh, uh, the city meet current standards. And then uh, 2011, uh, Moorhead uh, flood update. Uh, has shown that since 2009, they've saved uh, significant funds because of the work that we've done. And the Moorhead project is uh, completed, uh, to the best of our knowledge, they just got money last session, $7.2 million last year, and that uh, is to complete the entire project in Moorhead. And the state and federal, or state and local money will be about uh, 105 million spent in Moorhead, but they are uh, uh, very well protected now. Representative Howe has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and I guess my question, it seems like I continue to get the emails from those folks up there in the Red River that uh, there's still that ongoing battle with what the North Dakota is going to do with the Army Corps of Engineers. And how does that to relate to our projects here? And what effect is that going to have on us on our side of the, uh, the boundary there in our state? Director uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, Representative, the uh, the federal project uh, is a diversion project in uh, North Dakota, so it takes water from uh, essentially ar essentially around the two cities. Since uh, you know 2009, we embarked on protecting the city of Moorhead through levees and pumping stations and flood walls, so they're pretty well protected. Uh, the diversion project that the federal government uh, is looking at with the uh, combined cities there provides a, will provide a greater level of protection. It'll uh, divert a lot of the water around town. The water that goes through town will be much lower and much e more easy to contain. So they'll have a greater factor of safety. The, uh, the piece of that project that's uh, growing much, or ha that locals out there have had lots of concern over is to make the project work, they're putting a dam on the south end of Fargo-Moorhead that will impound water and hold it so it uh, can gradually be re released around town. To do that, they're going to temporarily inundate 50,000 acres of farmland, some in Minnesota, some in uh, North Dakota. Those people have raised uh, concerns over those impacts and whether or not they'll be properly uh, uh, protected from damage. So the, um, you know, we're in the process of doing a state environmental impact statement, and that's required because the dam that they're going to build to temporarily hold these waters is a high hazard dam, and it's a mandatory EIS in Minnesota. So we're in the process of uh, doing that uh, EIS, uh, and. You know, ultimately, I guess after that, we would have to evaluate permits and uh, options for uh, the project. Representative Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I learned a long time ago to an ill effect of, for me, uh, to always get the definition of terms because your definition and the federal government definition and my definition of temporary might be all different. So when you say you're going to temporarily hold back water, What's your definition of temporary? Um, Director Lockes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative, the, um, uh, this, is, this would be done for a springtime flood, is, is when the issue is in uh, Fargo-Moorhead and on the Red River. And, um, and, and you're right, I think the definition of temporary uh, varies uh, significantly. The, uh, they're looking at, uh, at uh, uh, several, two weeks several weeks of inundation. And obviously, close to the dam, the water levels are uh, you know, 10, 12 feet deep, and it gets shallower as you uh, go further south. And the Corps of Engineers, when they calculated their 50,000 acre feet of inundation, just included the areas that were inundated by more than one foot of water. So you're, you're right to be cautious about uh, definitions. Representative Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I can, I can understand their concern up there because uh, 
you know, there's a lot of estimations that aren't, doesn't quite work right. And when they, when they estimate a two-week inundation, uh, especially for farmland, that really takes a long time to dry out. And in your, your, your application of seed and trying to get back into the field, and especially at later times, really delays your ability to what crops you can grow and how that plays out. So I think that's a, a very important thing to, for us to be concerned about on our side, side of the line there. Thank you. Um, Representative Hansen has a question. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Chair and Director Lacasmo. I think, uh, I think it, what uh, Representative Hausman uh, had prepared showed a local share and a state share, and I was intrigued by your uh, comment about Moorhead with a uh, hundred million dollars, and I think I've, I think I've been around long enough where we've heard this is the last fifty million needed, and then there's another couple years, and it's the last fifty needed. And I think in Representative Poppy's district, the city came forward with a local option sales tax and to help pay the cost to get the job done. And I'm just wondering, with that hundred million of state dollars, uh, was there a local option sales tax to help get the job done in Moorhead or in any other these communities where uh, we're spending a lot of state money? Uh, Mr. Director Chairman, Lockesmo. Representative Hansen, in, uh, in Moorhead, uh, and I'll, I'll get into the cost share more specifically in a few slides here, but uh, the statutory cost share is 50-50, and uh, that has been varied by rider language to include a, a, uh, a different funding scenario. That is 2%, the local share was limited to 2% of the median household income times the number of households. And when you look at uh, Moorhead, that number, actually it started out at about uh, $8 million of their local share. Uh, when we got the new census number in 2010, we adjusted uh, all of these based on the new census numbers. So we used the best available data. Their number jumped up to about uh, 12 and a half million. And actually out of the 100 and, and the city then sold bonds. They don't have a local sales tax for this because they also are trying to compete with uh, Moorhead on, uh, on uh, sales. But the, uh, they passed a bond to fund uh, uh, flood protection, and the city has about 30, 30 plus million into uh, that project, and the state has 72 or so. So out of the total of 105, there's about 35 from the state and 75 from the, uh, or, I mean, I'm sorry, 35 from the city of Moorhead and about 72 or so from the state. Representative Hansen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and some of the other large projects, when we move up the valley, uh, is there any other, are most of the local communities bonding then and, and uh, going to the property taxpayers to uh, pay those bonds off, or is there other revenue that's generated uh, to pay for those local shares? Um, Director Lockes. Mr. Chairman, Representative Hansen, um, I think it's a combination of uh, of uh, funding sources, there's some bonding. And on some of these small communities, the local share is, uh, is uh, quite small. I mean, for a city like uh, uh, Halstead or a Climax, uh, you know, it's uh, under $100,000 or in that ballpark for a three and a half to $4 million project. So the local contribution is, is uh, quite small on many of these. Representative Hanson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So. It appears we're variable uh, where we are around the state uh, responding to flood and prepare, preparing for future flooding, which is going to happen. There's, there's differences in how the local communities approach this. Director uh, Mr. Chairman, Representative Hansen, um, yes, it is variable. The legislature, though, since about 1998 has included that 2% uh, rider language for most communities. And uh, some communities, like uh, the project in South St. Paul, their 2% number is very large, so that ends up being a 50-50 share. Uh, Austin, it was uh, basically, it, it equaled out 50-50 or 2% was about the same number. So many of those, uh, I mean, we look at uh, doing the 50-50 until they would get to the 2% number. But most communities and most small communities have exercised and been able to use that 2% funding option. Representative Bugidius has a question. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, 
going back to the EIS that's being done on the dam and following up on Representative Howe's question, um, in, the, in Wilkin County, they have a really good drinking water source. Their groundwater is in good shape, mm -hmm. as far as we know. How, how are you approaching uh, protecting that or analyzing the impact on that drinking water source with your EIS? Um, Director Lock, Mr. Chairman, Representative Wagenius, I would have to go back and uh, look specifically at the EIS, and I can do that and provide it to the committee, but I don't believe that issue is addressed. <coughs> Representative Wagenius. I don't see how in this day and age we can't be addressing uh, the, the uh, drinking water, the groundwater, uh, because if water is going to be held on the land, it, I don't know what kind of soil that is. I mean, is it sandy soil or is it loam or whatever? We need to know how fast uh, that's going to go into the groundwater. Are these, um, how close is the groundwater to the surface? I don't know the answer to the questions, but it seems to me that you cannot have a complete EIS until some of those questions are answered. Director Locke as well. And, uh, Mr. Chairman, Representative Wagenius, the, uh, our state EIS is supplementing the federal EIS, and it may have been covered in that, but I'll, I'll look at that uh, question and, and get back to the committee. Thank you, Director. Uh, Representative Wagenius. Thank you. One of the reasons I bring that up is that at some point, I mean, I know that Moorhead itself has looked with coveting eyes at uh, the Wilkin uh, drinking water source because it was so good and uh, if they are going to have problems um, we ought to just be watching out thank you uh, please continue director the uh, the flood hazard mitigation program started in 1987 and we've completed uh, you know many projects across the state and like I said we're, we're looking at removal of structures from the floodplain first and then uh, providing permanent uh, protection uh, th through structural means as a, as a second. The, uh, the cost share uh, that the Representative Hansen was asking about is specified in law as a one-to-one uh, -one local match. Federal projects, uh, we would then be splitting the non-federal share of a federal project. And as I said, that rider language that's been in the bill since uh, 1998 has, uh, has used this 2% of the median household income uh, funding scenario. Uh, this just shows the history of uh, flooding and this, or history of funding to address fund flooding. And uh, you know, the big spikes in uh, funding on this occurred after uh, major flood events. You know, 1998 was the first, uh, the first big uh, amount. And, uh, and certainly then in 2000, uh, uh, 9 and 10 and 11 when we had uh, relatively large flood years. And this chart includes uh, uh, both general obligation bonds and general fund and includes the uh, regular and special session uh, funding. We have funded uh, <coughs> flood mitigation after uh, federal disasters. Director, have these um, bars been adjusted for inflation at all? Um, Mr. Chairman, no. These so are the actual the appropriated amounts. Straight dollar amounts. Thank you. Uh, this just shows the distribution of projects uh, across the state. The uh, uh, red are the ones that are completed and the uh, blue are in progress. And what we've done on, on funding projects is to fund uh, complete phases that are of benefit by themselves and to fund it uh, as they're ready to build. So you can, uh, and the dots are where the uh, flooding has occurred in the state. The top, uh, uh, Flood risk areas, the most repetitive damaged sites in the state were uh, Rosso, East Grand Forks, uh, Warren, and Breckenridge were probably the top four prior to this project, and they now all will have uh, permanent flood protection. This uh, is a, a picture in East Grand Forks uh, after the flood. The, basically, the floodplain's been vacated as now as a state recreation area that uh, is floodproof. Uh, this is Montevideo. The, uh, uh, the red dots show all of the homes that have been acquired. This is the Smith edition, which has basically been vacated by the, uh, 
uh, where the floodplain has been vacated. Uh, this shows the city of Oslo during the 1997 flood. Uh, the city doesn't have access uh, other than by air or boat during a flood. And, uh, but this uh, levee around town has avoided uh, $78 million in damages since it was first constructed. And this is a picture of a flood impoundment uh, project. This is the Agassiz Valley project that's up near the city of Warren in the Middle River, Middle Snake Tamarack River Watershed District. And this uh, just holds water so you can let it out into the system when the threat of flooding has declined. And we have, uh, you know, talked to, uh, you know, various cities and done a survey of our grantees and, and there's a significant support for the program. We've made a, a lot of progress in the state. The, uh, you know, Moorhead, Monty, Austin, Rosa, Warren, Crookston, all have, uh, have protection that they can rely on. The, uh, you know, when you see floods now, we aren't hearing about all of the uh, impacts that we've had in the, in the past. There's, uh, it's pretty much a non-event in most communities across the state. And we're looking at, uh, as I said, about 25 million would provide the base level of flooding to communities in the state. And there would still be additional funding needed for impoundment projects and, and some of the watershed district projects. And the floods uh, and the standards uh, change. I know FEMA is looking at some, uh, some new standards for uh, uh, even determining what the 100-year flood is. So some of those happen. What happened in Rushford, you had a larger event. So you don't want to be tied just to a minimum level of protection. And that is the last slide. I put this on there because there is a light at the end of the tunnel. I know we've been saying that there's been a lot of uh, uh, flood funding in the past uh, decade or so. But we are nearing uh, completion of the uh, community flood protection. Representative Hausman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Is it fair to say we are moving uh, uh, more away from uh, dikes and more to impoundment in, in terms of, of what, how we mitigate? Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Hausman, well, yes, because we're almost done with the community protection of needing the uh, levees and the uh, pumping station and flood walls. So the remaining work that can benefit and reduce future flooding would be uh, managing the water on the land through impoundments. And Mr. Chair, m my understanding is that we're beginning to understand, particularly in a place like the Red River Valley, where when the flood is gone, they have no water. And so some. holding the water on the land is a, is a smarter way to to deal with it? Isn't that part of the motivation, at least in the Red River Valley? Director Locke, uh, small. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Representative Hausman, uh, certainly they, they go from uh, flood to drought uh, conditions relatively quick there. And holding some uh, water on the land and allowing infiltration is, uh, is a benefit. And uh, most of the projects now that are built have multiple benefits and include natural resource enhancement uh, type benefits. So there are. Uh, there are broader benefits than just the temporary flood impoundment in the spring. Representative Guinness. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, back a couple of years ago, we were talking about three or four, 500 year floods in the span of 10 years or so. And that's because our uh, projections were not up to date. And my question is, is how up to date now are our projections of what really will be based on what we now know about global warming and the impacts on major events. How up to date are we and confident are we of the level of projection we're making? Director Locke as well. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Representative Buginius. The, you know, one of, the, one of the issues that we've long had with uh, floodplain management is the term 100-year flood event because people think that it only occurs once in 100 years. And it's actually just a probability that it's got a 1% chance of occurring in any year. And any year starts new every day. So it is, it is just a probability. The, uh, uh, we are getting better. We are doing remapping within the state. We are looking at new hydrology. I know for the Fargo-Moorhead project, they looked at, uh, at uh, using different hydrology. 
and shortening the period of record. So they, uh, they looked at uh, what's happening more recently are larger, more often flood events. So they did take that into account. And the FEMA standard that they're looking at uh, amending in rule in federal rules is, is, is asking that they take a look at climate adaptation and climate changes in determining what those events are. Representative Wagenius. <coughs> I understand the, you know, 1% issue. I think the, the thing I'm looking at is our projection of rainfall was so off. Uh, and we were basing our decisions on data that was so old. And now I think I'm hearing you say we have not updated that because we're looking at FEMA to make those updates. And we know the federal government is slow at best. So, but that's not helpful for us when we're doing our budgeting. So. We have wonderful folks at the University of Minnesota, starting with Mark Seeley, and I mean, these are just fabulous scientists. Do we have, um, looking, uh, talking with them, working with them, do we have up-to-date numbers on rainfall and how it's gonna impact us? Basic question. Director Lockesmo. Um, Mr. Chairman, Representative Wagenius, the, you know, we have a climatology office uh, within DNR that's actually, you know, situated over at the U that works closely with, uh, with uh, Mark Seeley. Um, and they continue to work. I know the, what used to be called TP40, which was this old chart of, uh, of uh, rainfall uh, intensities, uh, that has recently been updated. We continually work on that. And we are looking at the climate, uh, you know, climate changes and, and how that's going to impact uh, uh, future defense. So it is a, it is a work in progress. If I could. Representative Wigginius. Thank you. Okay. Um, work in progress is fine, but have we now updated, uh, given what we know, have we updated our projections of what we will need to spend on um, both fixing problems from floods and then in trying to prevent them from happening. So there are two things here, but m my question is, does, is DNR using absolute up-to-date numbers in making its projection? Director Lockesmo. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Representative Wagenius, as we build flood control projects, we build in a factor of safety. So they're built to a hundred year, uh, for a levee, for example, it's built to a hundred year uh, level plus three feet of freeboard. So there is room for, uh, uh, you know, different sized events. And uh, clearly in the Red River Valley, three feet of four freeboard is a significant amount because it's very flat and the water spreads out and doesn't uh, uh, bounce up uh, as much. So we are doing that, and we are looking at uh, continuing to build impoundments and build uh, other means for on-land storage of water, and that adds another factor of safety into the community protection. So we are looking comprehensively at, uh, I think, several aspects to provide, at least for flood protection needs. Representative McGinnis. I just feel like you're not answering my question. Uh, I'm looking at Austin, Minnesota, for example. Um, are we using the most current projection of rainfall events and saying to this committee and other committees, we are basing our projections of need on the most up-to-date rainfall science? That's my question. Director Lockes, well. Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Fulginius, the I guess to some degree, I mean, uh, it's hard to answer that question because the the design of these projects uh, is uh, you know is done by other consultants. These aren't done by the department for flood hazard mitigation. It's a grant program that uh, goes to local governments. Um, um, so. Uh, to some degree, yes, but I think we'll have to look at uh, what actually has been used in some of the recent projects and, and provide you some more information. 
Thank you. I think that would be helpful so we understand, you know, what the real number is out there, both for uh, preventing floods on one hand and on the other hand, paying for them when they happen. Thank you, Representative. We'll work on our crystal balls and see if we can well, foresee the future. Uh, Director, can you tell me how individualized these flood projections are as far as, you know, when you make changes in one part of a system, it often has an effect on other parts of the system. I'm thinking of the big ditch, for instance, is probably going to have an effect downstream. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, uh, yeah, that certainly was looked at, and one of the first proposals at Fargo-Moorhead for a diversion around didn't take into account, or didn't have any upstream storage. So that had stage increases of, uh, uh, you know, a foot and a half downstream, and actually the stage increase in the flood would have carried all the way to the Canadian border. So they went back to go to plan B, if you will, which was to create this uh, dike and dam on the south side of town and store water so you limited the impact on those downstream communities, but then you're trading off an impact on upstream uh, farmland and upstream communities by having that impoundment area. So the uh, impacts of the projects are, are evaluated so we aren't just passing a problem around. And so my question is, are these uh, are these 100-year levels individualized by community and adjusted for changes in the structures? Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, yes, they are individualized per community. And then they, I mean, when a, a structure is built, you would have to do a reanalysis of the numbers for stage increases. Thank you. Uh, Representative Hansen has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Director Lacus Mo. Have we completed the LIDAR funding for the, the whole state? Have we mapped uh, uh, the ground cover for the entire state, or are there areas that have not been completed? Uh, Mr. Director Chairman, Locke, Re Representative Hansen, I believe that is completed. I believe so, too. Representative Hansen. And, and Mr. Chair and Director Lacosmo, so throughout the state, there's different areas of fall uh, from where the water falls and how it gets to areas where it's retained and floods. Um, for example, in Mauer, Mauer County and, and the water that flows south into Iowa, you've got a, a variable topography and you've got um, large ditches that have occurred through those areas and you've got a bounce that, that occurs, but you can, you can kind of track that because you've got a, a, a different fall than in the Red River Valley where the fall is fairly shallow. Um, so retaining water on the land, I think we've had testimony in previous years about um, measuring where we could put structures and how we could hold water back. Um, and we've invested as a state money into RIM WRP to try to do that. Now that's essentially gone or the old model is gone so how do we slow that fall uh, around the state? If we're still, it seems like we're still in this challenge of build the dikes higher. Um, if we don't have some preventive or retention up gradient uh, where that water's coming from. And it also applies in, in metro communities as well when you've got the, the roof and the street and the, and the sewer systems. Um, how do we, what's the plan there? I mean, how do we deal with that if we don't have those federal uh, state matching dollars like we had before? Thank you, Director Lockes. Well, this will be your last question. Uh, Mr. Chairman and uh, Representative Hansen, the, um, you know, in the, in the Red River Valley, if we look at that specifically, there, uh, there was a provision in the Farm Bill to provide some cost share dollars for impoundments and those types of work. So the watershed districts within the Red River Valley are looking at, at uh, storing water on the land and equating and getting a 20% reduction in flow. It's a long range process. It would be 96 some impoundments uh, um, uh, to get there. So it's, uh, um, and that's building the impoundments like was on the slide here with Agassiz Valley, those large, uh, uh, large impoundments. And, and for other types of, uh, of 
cover uh, would be a benefit to slow down water flow. But what we're seeing in the valley, and actually there's some impoundments proposed down in the in the uh, Austin area also to to uh, to control some water down there. So it's not just limited to the valley, but uh, it, it the proposals recently have been to to construct those larger uh, larger impoundments, and there isn't anything really for uh, uh, just general land cover that's going to slow up the water flow. Director, I believe our next testifier will have some in more information about the Red River Valley and the impoundments therein. So uh, thank you for your testimony today. Uh, Mr. Harnack, would you like to come forward? Please introduce yourself for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Ron Harnack. I'm a project coordinator for the Red River Watershed Management Board. It's a uh, nine watershed district uh, joint powers authority uh, in the Red River Basin. And one of their primary goals and objectives for establishment was to provide comprehensive and coordinated flood damage reduction and uh, water quality enhancements uh, for the Red River Basin. Um, I want to just echo some of Kent's uh, perspectives here. The flood damage reduction program has been a very, very significant benefit to the state of Minnesota. Preventative measures far, far outweigh our ability to uh, continue to fight after the flood has occurred in these instances. And we've seen, at least in the Red River Valley and, and certainly in other parts of the state, that the monies that we have put in, we do not see the kind of flood damages occurring anymore like we did in the past. And we do take a look at the climatic changes the, that we're seeing in terms of precipitation, in terms of snowfall. And we have updated all our hydrologic models for the Red River Basin and, and the individual major watersheds to address those. Because as we look at building water storage facilities within the basin, we have to understand not only what the spring flood is going to do, but also what the summer flood events are going to do. As we try to build these as multi-purpose projects, we look at certainly the flooding issues, the damages downstream, trying to prevent those, uh, both to rural infrastructure, to agriculture, and these impoundments do provide a significant additional risk reduction for the communities that have levees. We don't expect we should have to come back and build levees higher because our climatic conditions are changing. Our perspective is we should be storing the water on the land to prevent any increases from having an adverse impact on those communities. And I think we're being successful towards that end. Um, we did complete for the Red River Basin uh, a couple years ago a comprehensive flood reduction strategy. That calls for a certain degree of protection for our communities. If we had looked at some of these issues 30 years ago, maybe 40, there's probably some projects that we would have suggested we relocate some of these small communities rather than trying to build a levee around them. But we're past that point in time today. So we're almost to the point where we are completing the permanent, I hate to use the word permanent, a significant risk reduction levy control for a majority of these communities. As we look at just this, and to answer a question before, so we got the structural measures on it, and then we got the non-structural measures. And our non-structural measures are looking at holding the water as much in place as possible. When you're dealing with glacial lake agassiz, which is heavy soils and flat as a pancake, it's very difficult to just say we're going to put a small control structure at one spot and expect to hold a lot of water. What we're doing is, is we're building four-sided dikes and we're bringing water in uh, to those impoundments 
and then gradually releasing those so that we can enhance the biological integrity of some of our rivers and streams in the Red River. You can see, if you look at the Red River, and I had some photos to show, but I, I think I told uh, Gavin my uh, flash drive, uh, something happened to it, so it, it, I, I couldn't re recoup my stuff. Um, but the Corps of Engineers back in the 50s and early 60s channelized just about every major river in the Red River Valley. And the intent of that was is for the benefit of some communities, but also a significant benefit for agricultural productivity. Now, today, none of those would ever be done. And unfortunately, the purposes for which they were originally intended are not occurring today. Because of the way they straightened channels and did not deal with sediment uh, control, we're having more localized flooding than before. So what we are doing as part of our overall flood damage reduction strategies is saying, let's also restore these natural resource areas. So we're building a large impoundment. Some of you saw uh, North Ottawa, which is about three square miles worth. We're building another one uh, called Red Path that's about three square miles, but is also restoring nine miles of the Mastinka River that the Corps channelized way back when. We're going to manage this impoundment for waterfowl production, northern pike spawning, flood control, as well as providing a certain portion of it to be retained in agricultural production. We need to be able, when we build these projects, to provide for the long-term O&M rather than just having a pure reliance on the tax base to provide for that long term. Uh, and we're being reasonably successful with that. On one of our projects, uh, we have only had to twice in 10 years had to adversely impact the farmers farming of that. And then we reimburse them for their, for their costs because certainly they're not eligible for flood insurance when a government entity comes in and you know, is going to flood them out in one way, shape, or form. So our projects receive a lot of local support. They receive a lot of public support from the agencies, from local conservation organizations, and from the communities that are providing, uh, that this uh, protection is be provided for. Uh, I know next week, uh, according to Gavin, we're gonna get into some of the individual projects uh, at your hearing next week, and uh, We'll go into some of these in, in greater detail. Uh, I'd like to just hit on a couple issues uh, that I think are Im important going forward is we believe we're going to receive about five to ten million dollars over the next five years from through USDA to assist in some of our our floodwater retention water management projects. Um, some of that may be solely for the natural resource enhancement components because of the limitations and constraints of those dollars to deal with uh, uh, the flood water retention itself. But at least it will be something that, that can help defray part of, the, part of the state and local cost. The other element is, and you heard from MMB a while back regarding some issues of concern regarding potential for private use and some of the impacts that that has on general obligation bonds. One of our issues that we have is we want to be able to have projects that can accrue some revenue for long-term O&M. And we would like to establish O&M funds. Uh, one of the things that we are constrained from doing from MMB currently is that anything <coughs> on an annual basis that we take in that's above and beyond our minimum annual maintenance has to be returned to the state. And I think any of you who know who manage public projects or are familiar with roads and so forth, you can't deal with that just on an annual basis. You really need to look at the longer term O&M for a project and how can you deal with that. So we're hoping that we can kind of work something out with MMB on that or even some legislation that could help, help us deal with those issues looking at long term. 
Um, this year, I know the governor hasn't got his proposals out. Uh, however, working with a number of the communities uh, in the state and looking at what we feel this, this year, for the calendar year 15 or FY16 construction season, we believe there's a need of about 15 to 17 million dollars for flood damage reduction that could be uh, significantly spent this construction season if uh, we can get those commitments out there and get things moving forward. Um, and we'll be talking about some of the specifics of that, I think, more next week, uh, uh, looking at some of the specific projects that, uh, that you'll have before you. Uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I, I'll be happy to answer uh, questions. Uh, um, I, uh, hopefully, when I get, can recoup my uh, PowerPoint, I will get that to the committee. And uh, I apologize that uh, that got, didn't get here. Uh, Mr. Harnack, could you just give us kind of a concept of, um, in the big picture of the Red River Valley, how much retention you have installed to date and how much you think we should be thinking about installing over the next 20 years or whatever your time frame is. Okay, Mr. Chairman, when we did the comprehensive flood damage reduction study for the Red River Basin, we felt we needed 1 million acre feet of storage that would achieve the 20% reduction in peak flow on the main stem of the Red River. If you take that and split that between Minnesota, North Dakota, and South Dakota, on some distribution basis, feel half of it, you know, about 40% on the Minnesota side or 45% Minnesota side, 45% North Dakota, and uh, South Dakota's got a small area, so that may be somewhere in that 10% range. Um, we have got about uh, 200,000 acre feet of storage in place in the basin today. And, uh, that, that's counting one project that's also a uh, 30,000, about a 20,000 acre, acre foot project that's not in place yet, but we got the land acquired for it anyway. Uh, so our cost is estimated about a uh, $1,000 per acre foot. Uh, so you can see that there is a significant cost going forward as we look at, look at this. So by my rough math, you're about just shy of halfway, is that? Uh, uh, we are not quite halfway. When you're talking about a million acre feet, and you know, we've got about 200,000 200, in place. So we're about How are the others, how are our neighboring states doing? I'm counting them at this point in that 20%. Oh, I see. So, so we're not doing so well. Uh, no, no. But the other thing I think that, you know, ties in with this is, the Basin Commission is also uh, working at a water quality strategy for the Red River Basin. You know, we accomplish a lot of other benefits with water retention and holding it on the land, and water quality is one really key benefit that's associated with it. We have a real struggle right now because Minnesota's laws, rules, and regulations are far more restrictive than those of North Dakota. And we really need to work towards getting some consistency and uniformity with it. I know you've seen some bills on the table saying, you know, for some of these border cities that uh, maybe they should be given some leniency because why should Moorhead have a higher standard than Fargo discharging into the same river system? And uh, so some of these all relate together as we look at flood water storage, you look at water quality, we look at drainage, you know, it, it's all part of water management in the basin and I think we're doing a pretty darn good job of trying to bring all that together through the watershed district's efforts uh, that we have ongoing. Representative Hansen. Thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Mr. Harnack. Eventually, don't we run into some challenges both with quantity and quality with our northern uh, friends, don't we have a treaty with Canada that um, requires us to be managing both quantity and quality? 
uh, before we send them our water? Mr. Harnick. Uh, Mr. Chairman and uh, Representative Hanson, I understand that there is, and the IJC uh, Red River uh, Water Quality uh, group is continuing to look at that, and I expect we're going to be hearing more from our northern neighbors as time goes on as they've completed their major study on uh, Lake Winnipeg. And I think that's why it's even more critical that the Red River Basin Commission, which is representative of Minnesota, North Dakota, South Dakota, and Manitoba, really uh, look at a comprehensive water quality strategy for the basin because we, we can't, we're not going to be able to do it alone. And uh, uh, the advantage of doing something like that is like we did with flood. Every major watershed in the basin has a flood retention allocation. There's no reason why we can't have a similar water quality reduction allocation for each major watershed that contributes to the water quality issues of the Red River of the North. Representative Hanson. And Mr. Chair and, and Mr. Harnack, so if North Dakota didn't want to come into compliance, if we achieve our goals on retention or even in the future quality, um, because it's a federal treaty between the United States government and the government of Canada, isn't there some way of achieving compliance uh, through federal action with uh, North Dakota? Mr. Chairman Mr. and Representative Hanson, I mean, that throws it into a, a much different political arena. You've got the IJC that, you know, they have various compacts and so forth that they deal with, and uh, certainly there could be some issues that come through that mechanism. Uh, I think we've got a good structure in place to move towards that. Um, um, we just need to make the effort to get there. Representative Hanson. Mr. Chair, it, it seems like uh, they're sending us the oil and we're sending them the soil. Um, and we should be able uh, with our, I think, number one trading partner to, to figure this out on a level beyond just the state. And, I think we've we've funded as a state, and we've support, and we'll probably continue to support the the uh, collaborative organizations working between the states and with the the Canadian government. But um, at some point, I fear they're going to, as they develop the data, you know, again, as there's more science, more data, and we can measure everything now uh, in the valley uh, that that at some point we'll have to have some decision making uh, for all states. Well, Mr. Mr. Chairman, Representative Hanson, North Dakota has bought fully in with our flood damage reduction strategy for the basin. And what we found in many instances and in five or six of the projects that we have already got in place, that the water quality impairments, particularly for turbidity, downstream of those impoundments are gone. So, you know, we are making significant efforts in those cases in reducing that yield, you know, that goes down the Red River. And we just need to continue that and, and be strategic about, you know, how we approach it. Representative Wiginius. Well, thank you. This is a, a good long-term issue to be discussing. I'm glad we are. Um, I mean, at some point, this does not have to be a treaty. I mean, we are kind of locked in thinking about that, but Red, uh, Canada can sue us. Um, certainly North Dakota felt very free to sue the state of Minnesota, which they've done, and if, if North Dakota isn't doing its fair share on water, mm -hmm. well, why aren't we thinking of suing them? I mean, why are we taking the hit? Mr. Harnack. So Ms. Mr. Chairman and Representative Guineas, you know, certainly litigation is a, an option everybody has on the table. I guess, you know, my hope would be is that we have been able to come to agreements on how to manage other aspects of our joint resources across the borders. You know, we should be able to do it also for a water quality strategy. We've done it for flood. We've done it for some other issues. Um, I'm hopeful that within the next few years we should be able to achieve the same for water quality. Representative Wiginius. Well, I would wish we were hopeful too, but that's not the way North Dakota operates. Uh, and we have to recognize it. That's not their, 
thinking pattern. I mean, they sued us, so we have to understand that that's the way they think. And I, I don't like Minnesota to be in the position to kind of be na naive yeah. or, you know, that we can be um, easy to bat around. But that's certainly the way North Dakota is treating us right now. I did not hear a question in there, Rep. Samaginius, so well, we're I nearing the end of our time. But I, I, I think it's something we all have to think about. Um, if we're doing as good stuff and North Dakota is not doing good stuff, then what, and we are going to be tagged with it in Canada, who so supposedly uh, is our friend, um, then do we just stand there and take it or do we respond? Time, time will tell. Hopefully this uh, multinational uh, group can uh, work through some of those problems and get everybody at the table. We know that North Dakota is not selling as much oil right now, but they're selling a lot more cigarettes, so maybe they'll be able to fund their work on their side of the border. Well, they, Mr. Chair, if they're selling a lot more coal, too. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman, maybe we'll just increase the cost of the frac sand we send them. <laughs> <laughs> All sorts of possibilities. So uh, I'd like to bring Director Locksmall back up for just a moment. Director, you've got this. I've been looking at your picture here uh, displayed up on the screen, and I see that you, I assume that you assume we're moving through that tunnel towards the light. Um, are we sure that somebody's not just adding more to that tunnel as we proceed? Uh, Mr. Chairman, we know which uh, communities have flood risks in the state, and uh, we believe that we've addressed those and the lists that we have. We deal with the applications that we've received for assistance. So uh, basically, we think that the $25 million for community assistance will finish the known projects that we have. Very good. Uh, Representative Lilly. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Welcome. Mr. Chair, very briefly, uh, any way we could impose a mandate that 1% of that water ends up in White Bear Lake? <laughs> uh, you can pass anything, Representative Lilly, but uh, having the outcome that you're looking for is not always possible. With that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attendance today. Thank you to the presenters. This meeting is adjourned.